in the book, it is, real, is It Real When It Doesn't Work? Uh, it was referenced in there, this account, toward the end of the 19th century, Swedish chemist uh, Alfred Noble awoke one morning to read his own obituary in the local newspaper. Alfred Noble had stated, the inventor of dynamite who died yesterday devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before, and he died a very rich man. Actually, the, the bad part of it was it was Alfred's older brother who had died, and the newspaper reporter had uh, bungled the epitaph. He wrote about the wrong guy. But the account, the account had a very profound effect on Noble. He decided he wanted to be known for something other than developing the means to kill people efficiently and for uh, amassing a fortune in the process. So he initiated the Nobel Peace Prize, the award for scientists and writers who foster peace. And the noble said this, and this is what I want to pick up on, is every man ought to have the chance to correct his epitaph in midstream and write a new one. That's pretty powerful when you consider what, what, what occurred and what, where, where he, what, he, what he gleaned from that. And we have to say, as it relates to us, praise God for opportunities to change our direction to return, if you will, to repent of the, the course that we were on and do the right thing, to leave the wrong path and, and go the right way. Such was Naomi's case, as we see in our text for today, as we continue our story of God, because that's really what Ruth is. It's a story about God and His faithful working on behalf of his people in the time of Ruth. But before we look specifically at the verses at hand, uh, I want to come up to speed. Because when you're in a narrative, uh, it's hard to walk in necessarily, you know, on a, on a given Sunday if you missed like the past one or whatever, and get the full gist. Because we've laid a lot of groundwork. And especially for where we're at today, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll understand in a moment when we come into our text why this is necessary. But to come up to speed as to what, 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 where we're at in the story, what was going on in the time here. Uh, what we're at, as it relates to historical setting or backdrop, we're during the time of the judges. And, and that in itself ought to say something, but if you want to know what the time of the judges were like, all you have to do is look up from the, the Ruth and look back at the last verse in the book of Judges, and, and you get it. In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That was pretty much the atmosphere of, of those 300 plus years where judges were, were raised up of God. It was a period... Uh, that I've referenced in the introduction, in the past message, uh, as dark times. The dark ages, if you will, for Israel. It was a, a time of relentless cycling. From serving God, to sinning against God, to discipline from God by the oppression of foreign people, and even enslavement at times which would be followed by a season of repentance on the part of Israel, and God would raise up a judge. He'd raise up a representative, a, a person, a military, uh, more, more in a military vein as you read the book of Judges, to deliver them from the oppressors. And then you would have deliverance at their hand, and then a season of serving God, then sinning against God, and it just, it just was a relentless cycle for Israel. It, it was a dark time. And the reason for this cycle, we talked about quite specifically last time. And we did so by going back to the, the land covenant, the Palestinian covenant in Deuteronomy. Because the period of the judges 
followed the period of the conquest under Joshua. The problem was, is they failed to do what God said. They weren't to make treaties. They weren't to tolerate the people. They were to purge all the gods, all the idols, destroy their high places, entirely wipe them out of the land. But they did. They came in, and the tribes, when they went to their designated regions geographically with the expectation they would continue to push these foreigners out and do the rest of the work, they failed. They made treaties. They embraced the people in, in, in intermarriage, which was forbidden, and ultimately compromise. Tolerance of their gods, and ultimately even idolatry on the part of the people of Israel. See, they had a covenant mandate and they had disobeyed against God. And as I stated last time, when we looked at the covenant proper in Deuteronomy, that what we learned very specifically and very simply, though an unconditional covenant was made that they would get this land, they will have that land. And I say they will, it will be theirs in the new, in the, in the, new, uh, the millennial reign. They're going to realize this and they're going to have it in the new earth. It's forever. God has promised that. It doesn't rest with the people. But what was conditional was their enjoyment of this land. And he said very clearly, you disobey me and there will be cursing. There will be hardship and it will be from my hand upon you in discipline for your sin, for your wickedness. But if you obey me, this will be just as promised a land flowing with milk and honey. You will prosper in this land. I will push out, destroy those, uh, defeat those who would oppress you. Your land will be abundant. Your crops will be abundant. You'll have adequate food and, and water and all of the blessings of God. That was promised. Disobedience, cursing, obedience, blessing. And we're in the time now in the judges during probably the time of Gideon, that's where we're expecting, we can't know for sure. But we're, in the, we're looking specifically at an individual family. Or we started with that. And it's the family of Elimelech and Naomi. And Naomi. And in their specific, specific moment during the time of the judges, there was famine in the land. <coughs> that ought to tell us something in light of the backdrop I just laid. We've got famine in the land of promise. Well, how can that be? It's supposed to be a land flowing with milk and honey. Because they must be in that period, in that relentless cycle, where they've sinned against God, and they're under the cursing of God. And there's famine in the land. And the consequences of that famine were that this family, Elimelech, Naomi, they end up leaving the promised land. And they go to Moab, a pagan place. They go to a pagan place. So he takes his family there. He leaves the promised land. And, the, and, and what befalls him, as we noted last time, were, were consequences of that decision. And the consequences were, were, were pretty severe by anybody's definition. What were they? Elimelech dies there. Naomi's husband dies. Her sons die there. Malon and Chilion. And then Naomi is widowed, left widowed, in a foreign land. Very, very uh, precarious place to be for a woman in ancient times. Very tough place. But she's not only widowed herself, but now she's with two daughters-in-laws that are widowed as well. So we have three widows. Two Moabite daughters-in-laws and one Jewish woman in a foreign land, but they're all widows. Her epitaph, had she died there, her epitaph, had she died there, might have read as in verse 5. It might have said on her tombstone, a woman bereft of her two children and her husband. Just a simple statement of her harsh reality. But you know what? Praise God. Praise God. That the, the story of, of Naomi doesn't end there. It doesn't end with a woman bereft 
of her husband and her two sons. She repents. She's going to repent. And that's where we find ourselves today. I want to read verses 6 through 14 with that said. Let's look at this. Then she arose with her daughters in law that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her uh, two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be, uh, be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband." If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. What we learn here in these verses is this. For the believer, for the believer, God's chastisement, you can call it discipline, should be met with true repentance. And with repentance can come blessing. Let me state it again. For the true believer, I mean for the believer, true believer, but for the believer, God's chastisement or discipline should be met with true repentance, and then that repentance, that repentance with that can come blessing. Can come blessing. This is what we see in the story today as it unfolds. And we're going to take this portion of, of the story this morning in two parts. We're going to look at Two, we're going to break it into two parts. So with that, let's go ahead. Let's look at the first part here. As this truth is brought home, discipline bring, be, uh, being met with re repentance, and that in turn uh, being uh, an opportunity for blessing. The first part, I, I, I had the return, the return itself, or true repentance. The return, true repentance. And this is verses 6 and 7. I want to read it one more time. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return to the, from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-laws with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now I preface this point in the study with this, Barry McGuire was a uh, contemporary Christian artist back then. He actually wrote uh, uh, not a, a secular song on the, on the eve of destruction. Uh, and then, he, then when he got saved, he wrote uh, albums for the Lord. And one of the lines the album I referenced last week, and, and the song was, is, I don't believe in luck, I believe in Jesus. I don't believe in chance. I believe in Him. And that ought to be the mindset of every believer. We don't operate as fatalists who walk around in, in random happenings. We serve a sovereign God who works in our circumstances. We're to take notice when things happen in our lives. Now I'm not saying we should go around and be so... <coughs> Freaked out, if you will, that we can't even function because we're constantly looking that God's out to get me because that's not the case. 
Because what I'm talking about is looking at all of life, the good and the bad, and seeing it in the, in the perspective, in the prism of God, through the prism of the Lord, all, the, all that occurs. Everything. See, we're, we don't operate on, the, on the, the, the issue or with the idea of random or chance happenings. The point, as stated last week, is I see this famine in Israel that took Elimelech and his family to Moab at, was the discipline of God upon Israel in the land. You say, well, what are you talking about? That relentless cycle that I had mentioned earlier. So we had famine in the land flowing with milk and honey, which was in keeping with the provisions of the land covenant that if you disobey me, I'm going to curse. There's going to be cursing. You obey me, there'll be blessing, there'll be prosperity. We got famine in the land flowing with milk and honey. Then you have to ask the question, why? And in the book of Judges, it was directly related to their disobedience, their sinfulness. So the land of Israel was under the discipline of God. And in the same vein then, if we're going to make it work for the nation Israel, then why would we think it'd be any different for the individual people of Israel? Because nations are made up of what? People. Individuals. And God's not just so big that He has no time for the individuals. In fact, Scripture clearly indicates He's all about the individuals as He accomplishes the big picture. His, his providential program that's going to come to pass, His will will be done, but He works and concerns Himself and molds and makes people praise God that you and I are part of the program. You understand that? You're part, you have a place. You do. You little old you, little old me. I have a part in it. My sovereign God, who's the victor in the end, who's going to reign forever on a new heaven, new earth, has a place for me. And Naomi and Elimelech were in that place with the nation Israel in the land flowing with milk and honey, that had sinned against God, had come under famine, and what did they do? When the hand of God in judgment starts spanking the nation, Elimelech, a father concerned for the security, the, the, the well-being of his family, you got to give him that, he goes to Moab. He goes to Moab. But what was Moab? Moab isn't the promised land. And he goes down here. He goes down here. So Naomi's hardship in Israel was for leaving the promised land regardless of the circumstances that moved Elimelech to take him down there. It was a bad move. And the consequences are the results of it, the death of Elimelech and the death of the two sons and a, a, now a destitute, widowed Naomi with two widowed daughters-in-law in a foreign land are the consequences of it. See, as I stated last time, it's very hard to see this all as bad luck. Now, some of you say, well, Pastor, I, I can see it as bad luck. I, you know, things happen. You know, you know the saying. <laughs> things happen. Well, they do happen. But believers, whose God is God and is sovereign, don't look at everything as just random occurrences. The same God tells us in the book of Romans that He causes some things to work together for good. No, what's he say? All things to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purposes. Not some of them, all of them. So what's that tell me? The, well, the God of the New Testament who's in control of all things and can bring them into my life and everything that comes in and out of my life ultimately has a purpose and He's going to work them out according to His plan. Did He change 
Was he different back here? No, he wasn't. And that's what I'm saying here when you look at this book and what's going on here. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, I've been blown away in reading the commentaries on this book at how quickly we're, we're willing to say that, you know, they just hit a hard time. Man, it flies in the face of what this whole book's about. It's just, it's just very difficult to see this as bad circumstances. You know, we're living in a, a fallen world. These happen. Yeah, they do. But my God, though living, I'm living in a fallen... I mean, that's a scary place. Think about it. How can you walk through this world with the peace that passeth all understanding where you've got random things happening, befalling believers, and you can just write them off as chance? No, I want to believe that everything that happens in my life, good or bad, has to pass by my God. And that no matter what I face, good or bad, He is God and can, can use those to bring about good for the people of God who love Him and are called according to His purposes. And I believe for Naomi, you can't look at her circumstances. I'm not down on Naomi per se, but I'm not giving her a free pass here as a victim to just rough circumstances that occurred in Moab. They should have never went. Because this book, this book features a sovereign God who's working providentially for His people. Loving, caring, being there for them. That's what the book's about. But yet we want to plug in this random idea that stuff happens, and yet the whole book is about this awesome God. And it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. And I don't even, you'll see that I, as I develop this, or as we go through this text, Naomi's aware of this. She's aware that God's in total control of this. But here's the deal. She, she, she repents. She, start, she repents. It says in verses uh, 5 there, pick it up at 5, then both Malon, Chilion also died and the women uh, the woman was bereft of her two children and her husbands. And look at six. Then she arose with her daughters-in-laws and returned from the land of Moab because she heard that God had visited his people. So they departed from that place where she was with her two daughters-in-laws with her. And they went on their way to return where? To the land of Judah. To the land of Judah. This term returns is, is sprinkled multiple times in the verses I've read to you. Returns, returns, returns. And it, it serves, as one commentator put it, Reed put it, as an apt illustration of repentance. And I thought it was really good what he said. He said, Naomi reversed the direction she and her husband had taken. She turned away from Moab and the errors of the past. She turned her back on the tragic graves of her loved ones and headed back to Judah, her homeland. Her homeland. I say more than that, she headed back to God's promised land. She went back to the covenanted land. Notice the motivation for her returning in this text here. Verse 6 gives us one. The Lord had visited His people in giving them food. Okay, so where are we at now? Because we say, or I say, in keeping with what we looked at last week in that covenant, that land covenant, where disobedience brings cursing, and obedience brings blessing, we had famine when they left, and now she hears what? There's food in the land, which means what? The famine has been lifted has been broken. And notice how she viewed it. Well, how did she say it? The Lord. The Lord had visited His people in what? Giving them food. So what's that tell me? He took it away and now He's given it back. She sees this very clearly. She see, I'm telling you, she's, she's seeing this. Naomi's sharp, sharper than most, because she's figured this out. 
I got to get back where God's people are supposed to be. There's food there now. And she recognized God, that, that, that chastisement has been lifted. There's food there. So she's recognizing God's hand in the breaking of this famine back in the land. Then in verse 13, we pick up a further motive, and she says something here that most guys write this off as her feeling wrongly or judging God wrongly. And it is in this statement, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. For the, land, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Why does she repent? She recognized we left because of famine. Famine's broken means God's delivered food to the people. She's making some connections. She's seeing God is sovereign in what happens back with the people of God. And then she also sees that individually, that same God is responsible for little old Naomi's situation in the sense of what he's doing. He's not the author of sin. There be no death if man hadn't fallen. But the reality is, is God chastens His people. And he's, he, he's calling her back. And she says, the Lord's hand has gone forth against me. That her circumstances, she recognized, were in reality the discipline of God. That He had chastened them there. So what's she do? So Naomi, we're told, she returns in repentance, but not just, and I want you to see this, because don't miss this, not with just her voice, but by her actions. See, we, we, we want to pretend we repent all day long, but we never change direction. We never return fully to God. And this is true repentance because not only has she verbalized what's happened and what is happening and as flowing from the hand of God, but she's responding properly to it with true repentance by not only acknowledging it, but by taking action. And what's the action? She's returning. I'm going home. I'm going back. So with her daughters in tow now, in tow, she leaves pagan Moab and understand Chemosh that the god of Moab was akin to Baal and he was supposedly quote responsible for the earth and the prosperity of the earth and there was pagan immoral issues involved with the other uh, the, as it related to Baal with uh, his counterpart female co counterpart uh, Ashtaroth and uh, re sexual relations there uh, would bring uh, fertility in the land. Well, this Chemosh of Moab was akin to Baal, very much in the same vein uh, as, as he was. And so she leaves pagan Moab to return, and, and you got to say this, to return where? It says to the land of Judah, but where's the land of Judah? God's promised land. She's going back. She's doing the right thing. Now, here's my question. How, how does repentance play itself off in your life? And I, I, want you, I don't need you to answer that, but I need you to answer it in your own mind. When you repent, do you change direction? Do you return to God fully? That's the issue. That's really what defines real repentance is to have you change your direction. I'm not saying you're never going to fall again, but, but what we do is we acknowledge our sin, but we'll go right back to the same channels on the TV, same website on the computer, same trashy music maybe, same treatment of our family, our loved ones, our wives, our husbands. How far does our repentance go? True repentance is a, is a return, a change, a, a, a going back to God. And Naomi does it. 
God love her, she's got her chance. She's got her, she can rewrite her epitaph. She doesn't die in a foreign land bereft of her husband and her two sons. She's going to change direction and reverse the decision that was made. And she goes back to the land. Part 2 for today. Verses 8 through 14. Look at it. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. Return, uh, excuse me, with, your, to, uh, with you uh, and your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Uh, have I yet sons in my womb that uh, they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, go, for I am too old to have a husband. And even if I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, what would, you, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore remain, uh, refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the, the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Here's part two. Part two, the blessing, the blessing, dash, return, and hesed. Or kindness. It means more than that. We'll get to that. But I want to run through here. Real quick. Verses 8 through 13. They're on their way basically. What we see here is they're on their way back to the land. And I have to say this. They're on their way back. They're returning. Who can really return? Only Naomi. Because she's the only one who's left. The other two aren't Jews. But they were married to Jews. So they, un they were under the covenant. And by the way, I stated last time, uh, marrying Moabite women was not forbidden in the law. As with the Canaanite, the, land, the women of the land of Canaan. But the law clearly teaches that it, it wouldn't, uh, or the rabbinic law, mindset would have been that it wasn't uh, a desirable situation for the unequally yoked issues. Uh, the, the, they're serving idols, pagan gods, deities, and uh, you serving the real God. It's, it's a problem even then. But anyhow, they're on their way back. Naomi, Naomi's returning. And Naomi, part way down the road here, a light bulb goes off, if you will. And she starts realizing uh, that, that, you know, she, the, the girls shouldn't go with me. They shouldn't go with me. She becomes concerned for her daughters-in-law. What was her concern? What was her concern? I find this kind of uh, tough in a way. Because here she's doing the right thing, going back to be under the covenant of the God. And yet she wants her daughters to stay and remain in Moab in a region that is permeated with Chemosh. The, their, their, this other, this deity, this idol. You'd think she'd want them to go with them. But in her mind you have to understand something before you judge her too harshly. A woman alone had no security in ancient times. Her rest, if you will, her peace day in and day out, was attached to being married, having a husband. They, that was the place of the man to provide a home and security and these things. It, the woman alone was in a very, very, very tough spot uh, in, in the ancient culture. So she becomes concerned for them and, and uh, very specifically as to... The, the possibility, if you will, of marrying. You know, the potential for getting remarried if they come back. Because they're Moabite. They're widowed. 
They're Moabite women going back to the people of Israel, the land of Israel. She, she thinks that it's a tough place for them. And so Naomi encourages them to return to their home in Moab. Listen, we're only so far out. It's probably best you guys turn and go back. And, and go back to your mom's. And, and that, that, that's peculiar. And I haven't found a, a real reason on that one that I am real thrilled with in, in looking at why the moms, because the dads were alive too. And in a male-dominated culture, you'd think go back to the homes of your father. But it says go back to the homes of your mother. And one guy just made a comment. I, I don't remember who it was, but he, he hit on the fact that it's like going back to mom because mama is the one you go to when you're hurting or you're bereft. And they're widowed. Their circumstances are tough. She'll understand. But they're told to go back. And then in verse 8, Naomi calls upon the Lord here. And this is, this is powerful. Because what you find with Naomi is she's continually referencing the Lord. So what it tells us is though she understands that God's hand has gone forth against her, she's kind of like Job in this regard. She's not judging God per se. Some want to say she's bitter toward the Lord. I don't think so. I think she's reading this right, that we messed up, and she's seeing it for what has happened, and she's doing the right thing. If you're mad at God, why go back to Israel? I mean, why, why go back? Most people, they get mad at God, they don't come back to church. See, she understood. I mean, she, she didn't hate God. She didn't understand fully maybe why and all of it, but she understood that everything had to pass through the sovereign God. And he, he is God. And so she's doing the right thing. And she asked the same God, the same Lord, to bless them or to deal kindly. And this is the Hesed. This is the Hebrew has said here, and, and this, is, this, this word, uh, it's, it's tough to really translate in its entire, uh, what it encompasses, because it, it's, deal, it's kindness, it's, it's dealing kindly, but it's rooted, uh, this term really has its full expression in the, in the Old Testament as it relates to that covenant love and loyalty God has for His people. And so he's, she's asking the Lord, Yahweh, to extend this said to those girls. And I, I think that's powerful because uh, it, it speaks of her feelings toward these daughters-in-law. She loves these, these gals. She, these must have been, you know, real, as daughters-in-laws go, they must have been... Right on, you know, as far as mom, mom, you know, Naomi thought. These were quality women. And she's concerned for them, and she wants God to deal kindly the covenant God that they had married into. Not Chemish, but the Lord might deal kindly with them. And then she says, deal kindly, deal Hesed, as they had toward her sons and her uh, herself. What did it tell you? These, these gals were good wives and they were good daughters-in-law to, to Naomi. And she asked for God to bless that, to remember that. And then in verse 9, verse 9, we, we, we see her request and, he, and it is, may, may you remarry. The bottom line, she wants them to go where their best potential for rest, security, a safe place in that ancient culture was back in Moab where they might remarry, where they would have that. And so, so, so there, she, she wants them to go back. And so she kisses them farewell, and it says what? They wept. They wept. This was a very emotional time. One commentator spoke of the reality. Well, that was a cultural thing, you know. A cultural thing. <laughs> cultural thing in our culture. Mother-in-law's leaving good riddance type thing. You know, but, but, but the, the reality is, as we find throughout the record, though, is that Naomi had real feelings for these, these gals because she speaks of their quality as, as, as individuals. So I, I think it was sincere that there was real weeping on their part and probably on Naomi's part at the parting. And then look at verse, look at verse 10 again real quick. And they said to her, No, 
but we will surely return with you to your people. Now, I, I want you to realize how powerful that is and then what that means. Because what this means is not only do we have two quality daughters-in-law, but we have a quality mother-in-law because they loved her so much. Because what, 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 what's really what that means, what they're saying, is by following her, they were, they were abandoning their families, their mothers, their fathers, their, their home, their friends, their homeland, their pagan deities, and the, the, probably the prospect of ever remarrying. That's what Naomi meant to him. That's what she meant to him. So it speaks of the excellence of the person Naomi and the quality of these two gals. So they had a real desire to stay with Naomi, to, to have that hesed, if you will, that love loyalty toward her. in uh, that covenant idea where we're bound together here. And then in 10 through 13, Naomi makes her case, though, for their return. And she, she does it this way. Verse 10, basically there's no potential for the, the, the Leverite uh, law, the, 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 the marital remarrying uh, law that's in the Leverite arrangement in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. What was that? I'm going to simply state it. That if, if, if you're widowed and you have a brother, it was his, the, 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 if you're a woman, if you were a woman and you were widowed and there was a brother yet alive, it was his responsibility to marry the widow if she was uh, uh, childless and raise up sons unto the name of the brother. So that his inheritance, his place in the ledgers, in the rolls, it's never lost. It carries on. It goes on. And, and so that's what she's talking about. You have to understand that backdrop when she's talking about the potential for remarriage. That, that was the reason she starts making the case. She says to them, uh, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my wombs that they may be your husband? That's that Leverite, the Leverite uh, arrangement in Deuteronomy. There's no sons. I have no sons for you to remarry. So that's how she makes the case here. Uh, there's no potential for 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 for, 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 excuse me, for, for fulfillment <laughs> of that. But anyway, she goes on to say why, and it's because I'm too old. Not only am I too old to marry, but I'm too old to have sons. But then she gives a hypothetical to drive the, the case home and make the case even stronger. In a hypothetical situation, let's just say that I married. I was, I, you know, God allowed me that uh, gift to be able to remarry, and I could have sons become pregnant and have sons. It would, would you, you wouldn't be, you'd have to wait. You'd be older than I am by the time the sons were at a place to be able to marry and provide you with the security that I'm talking about, what I want you to have in this world. So her heart's sincere. She wants them to, to have rest in this world. So she goes on, and then she gives her assessment of it all in 13b there, and we've already looked at it. She says, no, my daughters, in light of the case she's just made, I, 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 there's no potential for the liverite arrangement to take place for you. I'm too old. I'm not married. I'm not going to have sons. And even if I could, you're, you're, it's foolish. You know, it's not realistic to think you'd wait till they were of an age to marry and all that. And then she goes, No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. So what's she saying to them? She's not undermining their circumstances to elevate, oh, woe is me, my hurt is far worse than yours. But what she's saying is, is you're young enough, you're young enough to remarry and have a life. For me, I'm past that. And in her eyes, she doesn't see the future as, as real positive for her. Real positive. Not at this point. Not at this point. So she, she wants them 
to go, go back and marry. And then in verse 14, look at this. And they lifted up their voices and they wept again. She makes the case and the reality starts hitting home again. She's pushing them back. And they weep again. And then it says, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. And, or but, Ruth clung to her. Very powerful, powerful words here. Orpah kissed goodbye and Ruth clung. Orpah kissed goodbye and Ruth clung. I told you what Orpah means. It means the back of the neck. And the verbal idea means to turn one back. And here's the thing. Before you're too hard on Orpah, though we, we might be a little, we, we might need to be at least honest with the situation. But on the positive side, she, want, she, she made a case to stay with her mother-in-law. She wanted to stay with her. That was her initial uh, response. But as the case was made for why she should return, she follows her mother-in-law's instruction and she goes back. But on the, on the negative side, she goes back to what? She goes back from the God of Israel to Chemos, to, to a pagan land. So on that side, that's the negative. But Ruth, it says, Ruth clung. This is an interesting word because the term that's used is one that's used of marriage between a, a couple and the covenant and what occurs in a marriage. The clung, the clinging. It's the same term. And what it, what it is, is she is actually making, by, by clinging to her, and what she's doing, it speaks of, a, of a, a, a covenant agreement of the soul before God that she's going to stay with Naomi no matter what. She's going to stay. So what do we have here? Well, blessing to follow repentance. The potential's there. What were the blessings? I'm going to give you three of the blessings that are seen here. And there'll be more coming on the last one. But the first blessing in this to me is that Naomi is given the opportunity to return to the land of her God. That's a good place. It's a good place. She's in a pagan place. A godless place. And she's allowed to come back. She's going to go back. That's blessing one. The chesed of God toward her. And then she's also uh, returned to the land of Elimelech. What am I, I mean by that? There's land that she has inherited rights to. That she owns. We're going to find that that land becomes very significant later in the letter as it relates to the kinsman redeemer. So she's got land back here. The blessing of God follows. She does the right thing. She gets to go. She, number one, she's going to go back under the, the bonnet of God, under the, the, the umbrella of the Lord in the land uh, of God. And she's going back to the land of her husband Elimelech that she has inherit, inheritance rights to. And then the third one, as I stated, we'll, we'll talk more about later, is she has Ruth's Hesed. Ruth has said, her loyal love. Her loyal love, it proves out, folks, in the end, to be the greatest of all the blessings other than she's right with the Lord. This is, this is not even the primary story. This is just a, a lead-in story to the greater story of Ruth. But Naomi and her situation and God's sovereign working in her life is, is the backdrop for the entire record. And what we learn here is what was stated as a proposition, and I leave you with this one more time, for the believer, for the believer, for you and me, God's discipline should be met with true repentance, and with true repentance can come great blessing. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We thank you always for your word. And I just uh, praise you for this little book, this little gem in the Old Testament of Ruth and what we learn about you, Lord. And I pray that th this would be truth that would truly uh, fill our hearts and our minds and take root in such a way that we embrace life uh, as we should and that we would make the right decisions 
in our life as your people and live in light of who we are in this world. But just bless each one today for being out. As always, Lord, we ask you to bless the day, the fellowship we might enjoy with one another. We ask your blessings upon the club ministries later this afternoon. And uh, we just trust, Lord, that this week ahead of us, uh, that those opportunities that are ever before us would be opportunities we don't let pass, but that we seize, that we might uh, lead people, introduce people to Christ and see Him saved, Lord. That's my prayer. Bless each one for being out today, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.